Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Mary Cerruti. I'm the executive director at the Walker Art Center, and I'm just ecstatic to welcome you here tonight for the first program in our new Abundant Cities series that was created in partnership with the Minneapolis Foundation. With tonight's focus on Minneapolis and on cities and really on place and the uniqueness of this place, I'd like to ground us by acknowledging that Minneapolis and specifically the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden are located on the contemporary ancestral and uh, traditional homelands of the Dakota people. This site, which used to be an expanse of marshland and meadow, uh, holds meaning for Dakota, Ojibwe, and indigenous people from other native nations. And they still live in our communities today. In addition to this acknowledgement, I also very much want to recognize and thank the Walker staff, many of whom pulled together, uh, and I'm sure RT will acknowledge the Minneapolis Foundation staff, but I will extend my thanks to them as well. Um, here at the Walker, I want to particularly acknowledge Amanda Hunt and Megan Leafblad, whose energies really helped create this program. Adair Mosley, the CEO of the African American Leadership Forum, for moderating tonight's panel, as well as the subsequent conversations in this series. And a special thanks to R.T. Rybeck, uh, who's been a tremendous thought partner uh, and supporter during the development of the series. We're thrilled to be hosting all three of the Abundant Cities conversations with an incredible lineup of individuals working across different sectors, each invested in cities and civic life in important ways. They are, I think are really going to contribute to the conversation about how Minneapolis can evolve and move into our next chapter together. Cities are really dynamic places, and tonight we have the opportunity to really dive deeper and think collectively about how we want them to work for us moving forward. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce R.T. Rybeck, former mayor of Minneapolis and the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Foundation, to share a few words as well. By way of introducing our panel, I want to tell you about the good old days in this city. It's 1985, and I'm standing at the top of the IDS Center with a really brilliant urbanist who's come to see our city. Proudly, I walk to the windows, floor-to-ceiling windows, overlooking downtown, and I say, here it is. And he pauses for a minute, looks out, looks back at me, and he says, where is it? What he meant was, in the good old days, the downtown Minneapolis that some romanticize, that some want to go back to, that downtown was about seven blocks. And if we took him back up today, we'd see something very different. He would look out on the riverfront where there were rail railroad tracks and abandoned properties and see some of the greatest real estate and parkland and public amenities you could find anywhere. He'd look out at the North Loop and see a neighborhood as vibrant as you could possibly find. He would see Loring Park. He would also look over to where the Metrodome had been built, surrounded by, again, parking lots, and now see $2 billion of new investment. And the point I'm making is that the basic tenet that people often want to go back to is no longer there and good. We now have a series of villages that make up this place that we call downtown, and it's surrounded by a series of neighborhoods where tremendous innovation is going forward. So as this pivot point comes, we at the Minneapolis Foundation knew that we wanted to push this discussion much further, and who better to be a partner on it than Walker Arts Center in this room? where so many of the great debates over the years have had taken place about where this city has gone. Anybody remember the debate about metal trees on Hennepin in this room? Walker has been very much at the center of doing that. So we're really proud of being able to do this series with Walker Art Center. M Michelle Benson, our uh, marketing vice president, is up above and is one of many people on our team who worked on this. We also uh, have contracted with a team of three people with incredible uh, history of getting things done in this city. Sarah Harris over there, Beth Shogren, David Frank. We asked them to not only help us put this together, but more important, to put together a report after this is done about some of the great ideas that emerge and what will it take to make it happen. And that last part is why the people on this panel are important, but you are even more important. 
because what we want is to generate lots and lots of ideas. And we want to take the best ideas and see what it takes to put them into action. People like Steve Kramer up there from the Downtown Council are already part of doing that work. We want to broaden this discussion. So look at the QR code on your uh, uh, pamphlet there. It's an opportunity to give us new ideas. The conversation afterwards will be also about that as well. We don't want to end this with three events talking about big ideas. We need to have a posse of innovation that pushes people and really helps pave a new way that we don't even know it, where it is yet, but that's you. So we want you to be very much part of this. As we bring up the panel, I couldn't be more excited about the person we have moderating. Adair Mosley is someone who many of you know in the community, many more of you should, because he's one of the great innovators in the community. His many years at Pillsbury United Communities uh, uh, and his last part as CEO of Pillsbury included many, many great projects, one of which is North Market in North Minneapolis, which is an incredibly innovative project that brings public health and grocery shopping and many other things to North Minneapolis. His many accomplishments really cross the Latino uh, partnerships in South Minneapolis, Somali on the West Bank, African American in North Minneapolis, and more than anything else, Adair is a person who this community has turned to for true innovation. And I know very much uh, in the days after George Floyd's murder, when there were all sorts of us getting together on the phones, what next, what are we gonna do about it? Adair was the probably brightest light in this community, inspiring us to not put everything back the same old way, but to reinvent. And so I wanna uh, welcome him to the stage to welcome all of us and have you have a good hour listening to ideas, but more than anything else, creating your own so we can create a great city. Adair Mosley. Hello. Good evening, everyone. We are going to bring some excitement to the room. We are going to be energized about the future of Minneapolis, about the future of downtown. Um, thank you, RT, for those kind words. Thank you for your vision um, behind this work. And I equally would like to give my uh, gratitude to the wonderful team that has kept this thing moving and have pulled this all together, uh, the Walker staff and the three individuals that RT mentioned as well. I am so excited to have these three on the stage as um, our, our first guest as part of this uh, panelist. So I want to introduce them. Their bios, of course, are in the uh, document that you have in the program. But we have Gabrielle Greyer, who is an artist, a visionary, a facilitator of growth, um, she enjoys shifting perspectives and intentional responses to social and political change, um, and most recently was the managing director at Juxtaposition Arts, and so we are delighted to have her with us. We also have journalist uh, Oscar Abello. Abello. I don't know why I want to make the two L's. Oh, why? Okay, Oscar Abello is um, a journalist covering policies, programs, business models, and, a, and a address um, social and economic change. You've largely looked at um, economic models to help black and brown entrepreneurs um, in coming to us from New York City. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the great visionaries of our city, uh, Tom Fisher, former dean of uh, the School of Design at um, the University of Minnesota, but is an author, a professor, and the director of the Metropolitan Design Center, and specializes in urban design, system designs, and ethics. And I am sure many people signed up to be here because your name was on the panelist, uh, because you are very, very brilliant, and um, we're honored to have you this evening. Tom Fisher. So as we start this conversation, I just want to give a little bit more grounding um, as we go into this conversation. But downtowns are the, um, tonight we will really center this conversation on downtown because that, that's one of the most prevalent conversations certainly in our cities about um, the rebirth of it. How does it come back? Who does it come back for? The intentionality around that. 
Um, downtowns or the central business districts have been the nucleus of cities. They are the spokes of the region coming together and are the most visible manifestations of a thriving city. And so we want to put some attention there. Minneapolis is not like other, uh, unlike other major cities across our country um, that have had a dependence on the worker, the business, um, the after work dinner meeting happening, or the out of towner for our concert. Um, but all of the 2020 happened and all of that shifted. And we had this pandemic on, um, on our doorstep that uh, certainly affected the entire globe. And now we're at this moment that technology has rapidly evolved um, in how we connect, how we work. And our downtown is not completely devoid of vibra vibrancy, but we are presented with a unique opportunity to reimagine its full potential and to live into what it can be. And so I start this conversation off by asking and just making sure that people can understand why are we, why are we concentrating this on downtown? Why is a downtown important to a city? Um, why is it a healthy or an indication of a thriving city? And maybe Tom, we'll start with you on that question. Well, yes, I think it's important to realize that downtowns, uh, in our downtown, has actually responded uh, to pandemics in the past, right? So in the 19th century, we had a cholera pandemic, which forced cities like Minneapolis to pay attention to water. So we had indoor plumbing, sanitary sewers, which allowed the industrial city that we knew to evolve, and remnants of which are still in the warehouse district in the North Loop. So we still have that city here. In, the, in 1918, we had an influenza pandemic, and that prompted everyone to want to socially distance, have their own car, their own single-family house. It prompted a century of suburbanization. And what that did to the downtown is it made the downtown a central business district, a specialized area that everyone commuted to in the morning and left at night, right? And so both of these two phases in the history of our city and our downtown were triggered by pandemics. And here we are again. We are now at the beginning of what I will argue is decades of transformation that is going to happen as a result of this one. Because what this one did, rather than the others, is that it helped us realize that for the first time in human history, virtually everything can get delivered to our door or our device. And so what that's done is it's rebalanced the digital and the physical world. And we all now have choice about whether we go downtown or whether we stay home and Zoom. And that is a profound shift in uh, how our downtown will function, uh, how we think about the downtown. And after each one of these pandemics, the downtown survives. It, it grows, it changes. There's tremendous opportunities that emerge as a result of pandemics. Uh, we shouldn't get discouraged. But on the other hand, we should be ready for transformation. Thank you. You know, um, Oscar, you're, you're coming to us from New York City, and um, certainly I think no other city, and perhaps in America, is one a great indication of a thriving downtown, a core. Um, many can, uh, if you are in the space of urban planning, uh, thank uh, Jane Jacobs because she stood up against Robert Moses, who wanted to put a freeway in Manhattan and actually uh, said, no, that it needed to be about vibrancy. It needed to be about the people. And so you, you talk a lot about this, but um, New York City in particular came back, or yes, it was certainly affected, businesses were affected, but it never saw the quite decline that some of our ma other major cities saw. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So you know, let me start out by recognizing there has been change in New York City. You know, there's the, the vacancy rate in Midtown, office vacancy rate is still like 40, 50-ish, maybe still, still 60%. It's, there's, there's not, it's not the same. Yep. But what you saw, what I saw living in New York City uh, after, what, you know, once, once things, once outdoor dining opened up, um, it was almost felt dangerous on the sidewalks. Like there, were, there, was, there was open dining everywhere. All these new sidewalk sheds going up, and it was cr everybody. Everyone was still there because uh, Manhattan is still very much. It's a mixed use uh, mecca, right? Like it's ev almost every building in, in Manhattan is. If it doesn't have uh, its storefronts on the bottom, and it's either office or residential above uh, my building, and uh, you know, I, I I walk outside my door to this to to another part of my building to to buy my my cats their pet their food and their cat and their kitty litter. So that 
mixed use presence as you know that never left even though even though it it, it was it was so eerie and and in some ways scary to see uh, you know in march and april of 2020 just total silence in the middle of the day at night you know there's a photo exhibit right now of uh of uh, broadway theaters all lit up because they have to be lit up by code in times square but no nobody on the streets that was scary, but the people were 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 around, and um, even though Manhattan, of course, notoriously, it's very expensive now, and it, you know, it, you know, the, the, that's a, that's a different problem. Like the affordability is a, is a different problem. The people were always were were, were still there, and um, it helped the city bounce back quickly. And you know, just one more thing about like Manhattan bouncing back quickly allowed the rest of the city. Mm-hmm. And the little downtowns and all the other little na- all the other neighborhoods, um, and, you know, some of them were ev- thriving even more during the pandemic when Manhattan, when no one was going into Manhattan, and there were downtown areas in Queens or Bron- or the Bronx or parts of Brooklyn, far out in Brooklyn, that were thriving even more because all these workers were still out there. You know, we're we're in a unique moment where we're we're trying to bridge what is the I call the impressionistic city. You know, your first impression and the statistical, so what you read about it. And right now, those narratives are not necessarily congruent. Um, If this is your first time in the city, if this is your first time in downtown, you might have a very, very different reaction than to what you read about it. Now, Gabrielle, we've, uh, in many regards, have sanitized our downtown, in Minneapolis in particular. Right, it's been uh, largely homogenization, over specialization, a cultural drift. It's been absent of some of that vibrancy. Um, and what is our opportunity now as we th- rethink this to actually bring some of those things back or into it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the main thing that we're thinking about right now is about the intersection of multiple different ways of thinking. So we're talking about, we can't just think about restaurants exclusive from cultural experiences or entertainment. We can't just think about residents and just being you know, separate from the experiences that people can have in those spaces. We're talking about hybrid, things that used to be mutually exclusive. We, it's now time for us to think about how to fuse them. How do we intersect them and how do we ensure that we are actually articulating the specifics of what culture is and how to make sure that people are at the center of all of those decisions. Thank you. So would you all say, even before the events of 2020, and I think this is important for the audience to understand, our city to understand, because many would say, were we even on the right trajectory? Were we on the right trajectory in our downtown? Had we, were we only catering? Part of, part of the issue that we're seeing is that we had a, um, a reliability on the worker, on the commuter, on the person that lived in the suburb to come into our downtown. We didn't center community. We didn't center those that lived here as part of, and not that we don't need those outside folks, but we didn't center, truly center the residents that, um, and those that occupy the space every day. So were we on the right trajectory? And Tom, I'll ask you. Well, I mean, pandemics are accelerants. And so almost everything that we experienced existed before COVID. I mean, we had Zoom before COVID. We had telemedicine. We had uh, telecommuting. We had all these things, but they were marginal parts of our economy. What uh, pandemics do is they make the marginal the dominant. And so uh, here we are now. We've actually been accelerated several decades in the future to under, sort of uh, live a different kind of life during the pandemic. And now we're faced with now what do we do? I mean, one of the other things that pandemics do is they reveal inequities. And this one revealed profound inequities, not just access to health care, but digital inequity. I think the digital inequality in cities like ours is profound and has to be one of our absolute uh, priorities to enable every single person to have the devices and the internet access that they need to survive in what is essentially a new economy. So, um, you know, I think we were already moving down this path. Mm -hmm. It's just that that COVID pushed us. So we we talk a lot about the worker and their role in the revitalization of downtown. And and, and as I've said it, we... I believe we had this, we catered a lot to those who didn't necessarily have the vested interest in in community and built it. And so there's a power dynamic in that um, because we're we're now begging them to come back into downtown. (laughs) Um, 
But what do you see as, how might we reframe this? And Oscar, you talk a lot about this, that there was this invisible worker that also came who was contributing to the economy that is often not written about or told or spoken about in the narrative, yet we talk about the commuter that's coming about. So you want to talk about that invisible worker? Yeah, so uh, the businesses that you know I see, you know, I'm, I'm visiting from New York City and there's hotels downtown that are still operating. The W Hotel is there. Uh, those workers were always there. Mm -hmm. um, the restaurant workers, you know, I went to, uh, I came in, I flew in on Sunday and went straight to the hen house. I had breakfast. Um, I had uh, I had breakfast yesterday morning at Hell G Hell's Kitchen, which is a worker-owned restaurant, right? Yeah. Where are those workers? Do they live downtown? They're benefiting in some way, and that's great that they have. There's a, this worker-owned restaurant downtown, but um, but yeah, do they? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd love to find out, but I only I only found out there was a worker-owned restaurant on Tuesday morning. So, you know, the 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 folks who are there, the work there are plenty of folks who still work downtown and benefit from being close to glo close to the baseball stadium. You know, the the manager of the hen house said baseball games that's a that's always a big draw. It's one of the few weekday draws that are left. And it's so paradoxical because there are essential workers and there's some of our lowest paid workers at the same time. They're probably the, one of the most important workers in the in the downtown. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some of the restaurants that I've been to recently, like in San Francisco, during the pandemic, they took the opportunity to shift from tipped staff and tipping to not tipping, to just having everyone be paid an hourly wage, uh, having one hourly pay scale across the whole restaurant, back of house, front, front, back of house and front of house. Uh, the pandemic let some of those restaurants experiment and successfully transition into a more equitable pay structure. Gabrielle, where are you coming in? Yeah, I was just gonna say, like we, I think we're talking about right now, who actually do we reference and discuss when we're talking about the workers that are downtown. And I hear us talking about this relationship around restaurants, but if we think specifically about Minneapolis, like the, the largest employers downtown right now are Target and the hospital, HCMC. And all of the discussions that I've heard so far, I don't know that we're talking about the nurse that works 14 hours you know, downtown, um, that has to think about the commute, um, where they're gonna eat, the possibility of having to bring you know family or people into those spaces like that's not the discussion those people are not at the center of the conversation and there's a reason for that um, and so I think what we're hoping to do today is also consider the expansion of who gets to be a part of that conversation mm -hmm. who is a part of the narrative when we're thinking about that um, and not just the people that live in the suburbs yeah, yeah definitely worth a hand clap <laughs> So, and, and I, I, I appreciate you centering because we, uh, we do, as part of our narrative, we, we do oftentimes talk about, I think we have a, the image of the person in the business suit, right? Uh, but there are a lot of people who are contributing to the, the downtown. And part of this um, reimagination is actually including them part of the narrative. And some of the subsequent conversations will explicitly get to this inclusivity factor, right? That we need to be considering as we as we think about the built environment, as we think about business, as we think about enterprise that comes down there. Um, I I'm curious uh, if we talk about uh, uh, Tom, uh, maybe you come in on this a little bit. That uh, we've kind of created our own problem too, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking more largely from uh, zoning practices and policies that cities have had. Um, that have exacerbated the issues because we've said that you know only this type of business can be on this block. Okay. And so can you talk a little bit about that Euclid, if you, if you will, model of zoning that has actually exacerbated this issue? Sure, for, for those who don't know what it is. So the, uh, I was referring to, so the, this was a Supreme Court case in 1926, the Euclid versus Ambler Realty, which allowed cities to have sort of zoning as we know it and single use zoning. So to, uh, there to sort of follow what you're saying is that we created this problem because we have this central business district that's largely been zoned for a particular kind of function, right? Commercial office buildings. And uh, half of those buildings are going to be empty. Virtually every Class B and Class C office building will no longer be an office building. 
it simply will not be an office building going in the future. And so the problem is we have a misalignment between what zoning is saying should happen there and what the market is going to demand that we do, which is create much more flexibility. Uh, we have a t way too much office space, way too much co commercial space, and not nearly enough affordable housing. Right, and so we need to find that we need to see this as a tremendous opportunity to address the very issues, Gabrielle, that you were talking about, which is where is that nurse going to live? Right, they need to be able to live close to where they work, and we need to create the kind of housing that that uh, diverse essential workers can afford. Yeah. Very valid, very valid point. So the 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 reimagination of our of our spaces can actually. What I'm hearing you say is can help us solve even some of these social issues that we're, when we talk about affordability, right. when we talk about lack of space for entrepreneurs, right. some of those things, how do we uh, reimagine that into our new downtown? That's great. Um, we're, so what, what kind of future do you see emerging? Um, as we think about this, and you, uh, maybe centering in, Gabrielle, a little bit on this, um, hybridization that you're talking about in new models of economic development. What kind of futures or trends do you see emerging in downtowns and specifically what's our opportunity in Minneapolis? You know, I really just think we need to blow it up. Um, <laughs> and and I mean that figuratively in, in you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> just, just to frame it so we're clear. Um, but what I mean by that very specifically is I have the pleasure of being on the downtown innovation group uh, with Peter Brown who's here and also Steve Kramer. Um, and we get to talk to a lot of people who are thinking about this. And one thing that I feel like is this constant emerging uh, conversation is actually not new. Um, what it actually is is the artistic practice to a T. <laughs> and I say that as an artist that um, we are not thinking of, I am not thinking about, you know, uh, whether or not the relationship between oil paint and this particular kind of canvas will work. I just do it. And then you figure out what, what the relationship between those two things are and you keep evolving it. And I think that concept around how do we think about the evolution of space is to think about the intersection um, that's part to me about design and an artistic and creative expression of, of how to do those things. But it also is around culture. Like, what are the things that need to be fused together? When we're thinking about collaboration, who's doing that? And what does it look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so these new hybrid, um, uh, you know, words, buzzwords are coming up like, you know, Edu inner education and um, entertainment and resumercial, these hybrids around like, how do we, how do we fuse it? You know, if I'm in the office, do I want it to feel like an office anymore? I don't know. Maybe I want it to feel like my house. Mm -hmm. um, and if I am an artist who's trying to think about reimagining a corridor space and thinking about public art, how do I think about the impacts of the pandemic? How do I think about people using um, technology and the digital world to help people be a part of that, even if they're not there for the whole four hours like, like we've, we've experienced art before? So I really think it's about um, all of us returning to the creative mind, um, and I'll bring Steve Kramer in here, the, the right brain and the left brain energy, how do those two things speak to each other to think about um, not things in mutually exclu exclusive um, models, but the hibernation of them. Yeah, that's great. Um, yes, yeah, lots yeah, of hand yeah. clapping. Love, yeah, this, yeah. love the front row here. Uh, <laughs> You all are, we, we know if we're saying the right things because we get hand claps here. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, one of the things, and I, I think it's an elephant in the room perhaps, or it's a narrative that's oftentimes perpetuated about uh, crime and then the undesirable activity, especially in Minneapolis, and we'll talk about it around some of our businesses. But you all talk about the antidote to that is actually building this rich environment. And maybe all three of you can talk about in this, in this next wave, it's actually the creation of activity. So if you want to come in on the, the way, the antidote to that crime is actually cr creation. More people, yeah. eyes on the street, as Jane Jacobs said, yes. right? And I mean, it's not only Jane's views of cities, but her economic ideas are really key now, which is she made an argument that in books like The Economy of Cities that the future economy is going to be city-based regions. 
And, um, and so cities and downtowns are going to become ever more important. But she had this idea of what she called import replacement, which was the idea that we cities need to go back to making things. And so one of the arguments I make in the, the book I wrote last uh, year about this topic is that, you know, a paradoxical thing about this uh, pandemic is it's accelerated us in the future. It's also lead, led us to think about the way the downtown used to be, because we used to have people working, living, making, and even growing things downtown in the 19th century. And we may be back there in the coming decades. So to, to feed off, yes, to feed off of that, because there's something about the, the creative class, right? right. And uh, the, the kind of knowledge hub, and maybe, um, and Oscar, you're saying this certainly with a lot of entrepreneurs who have not typically seen themselves in a downtown core because it's had an image. And then there's the artist, there's the maker, there's the doer, mm -hmm. there's the tinkerer that can be a part of this. So talk a little bit about actually that create the, the creative economy that can actually help bolster our downtown. Yeah, oh, um, I could talk about many things, but I think the, the main, the one of my most exciting, one of my favorite architects is uh, Bjorka Engel and what he's doing in Denmark. Um, and I think, you know, he has taken he has taken these traditional spaces um, in the area and saying why can't we have a garden with penthouse views with uh, that sits on top of a parking lot why is that not possible and why can't we think about the what that does for people in the economy but also specifically in the way that people experience those spaces he's also do, doing that all across the world but what I appreciate is saying that there is an opportunity to consider why people have separated those spaces, what was the benefit of that separation, whether we think about that from a racial you know, perspective, if we think about that from a social, uh, class perspective, you know, the, the separation of people, and what happens if we think about how to integrate these things that used to be separate um, that actually benefit everyone because the economy then shifts and expands. And so the creative uh, uh, possibilities, I think, are at the center of the fusing of that for our economy. Uh, Oscar, yeah, come on. Well, and I would also hope that in re-envisioning and reimagining the use of creatives, arts, the arts culture as a way to draw the artists and their work and the energy that they bring down, like if you want to bring, draw them downtown, uh, you need to be intentional about which artists, mm -hmm. which creators are you inviting, yep. who feel, which creators feel welcome, which creators feel like they belong downtown, um, including including chefs and and you know food entrepreneurs as as part of the creative like mix of like culture and arts, who feels welcome, who feels like they belong, and when they start coming, w what happens next? Mm -hmm. Because even Richard Florida learned, yes. yep. mm -hmm. if you just bring the creatives in and you let the old traditional real estate model follow that, yep. though that model will displace those artists. Mm -hmm. They will displace everyone else who doesn't have some kind of protection. You know, like New York City, like people don't even, we don't talk about like, rent stabilization in New York. Like everyone says, oh, it doesn't work, whatever. Uh, it, it, it limits housing supply or whatever. I'm like, yeah, but all these artists are still in New York. It makes New York what New York is. Mm -hmm. The fact that, they, that, that, that their, their presence there as, as painters, sculptors, comedians, screenwriters, mm -hmm. TV writers, they, they, they you know, they, they can still, it's harder, it's getting harder, it's gotten hard, a lot harder. Mm -hmm. You know, we lost, we lost uh, about a million rent regulated units over the past, from, from the mid 90s to 2019, when we finally closed this loophole in our rent, state, rent regulation rules in New York State. We lost almost about a million rent, rent regulated units. This is, this is wild. So like, we've lost a lot of those artists. And you know, I would say like, maybe the art in New York is a little bit not as what it used to be. And so we're clear, I believe architects are artists. Yes. Um, yes. I, I want to like just frame that. <laughs> um, 
that that they are. Um, some people, I don't know when that separated the design from the the artist, but they are. They are literally creating the imagine. They're reimagining space, and the design of that is art. True, very true. Oscar, you've so you've been spending the last couple of days touring Minneapolis uh, and getting um, w no no better tour guide than RT um, as part as part of this. But you've seen uh, great entrepreneurs. You've seen the kind of entrepreneurial spirit and the, the innovative spirit that's happening across our city. And oftentimes we talk about the down core. And yes, can be it is that visual kind of manifestation of innovation. But it's happening in other parts of our city. And so how does that actually, it's bi-directional. How does that actually start to fuse into some of our downtown as we think about the, the new micro entrepreneur, as we think about those that we want to give c access to capital to, to actually be able to come into downtown? And you've spent a lot of your career writing about that. Uh, I guess, I mean, well, I guess what you're asking about is sort of the, the, the not symmetry, uh, symbiotic relationship yes. between downtowns and, and, and elsewhere. And I kind of referenced it earlier, like Manhattan as a thriving downtown, Midtown, there's actually two downtowns, right? There's Midtown and there's the financial district, Lower Manhattan. And we, you know, if you wanna know, if you wanna know if these office buildings can be converted to, lo to, to housing, let me tell you, they did it in the financial district. We went from a uh, population of 20,000 in about 10,000 units, to now it's a population of like 40,000 in twenty in uh, in al in almost that many units of housing downtown, we just uh, we New York City just I think it this week celebrated the opening of the largest office to housing conversion ever, one Wall Street, mm -hmm. literally that's the address and that's the name of the building, one Wall Street. It's a million square feet, no affordable housing in there, <laughs> but but they did it. Well, okay, so what am I talking about? What I'm talking what I'm talking about is. Um, Manhattan's two thriving downtowns, New York City's two thriving downtowns, you know, the wor some, some of those workers, they may not live downtown, but, you know, they live on 125th Street or in Harlem or they live in the Bronx. And there's Fordham Road in the Bronx is an amazing, vibrant commercial corridor. Roosevelt Avenue in Queens, like every block of Roosevelt Avenue is like in a whole other country. You know, Nepal, India, Peru, Mexico. Uh, just one after another, just different blocks. The Philippines, that, that you know, Woodside is 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 one of the neighbors that Roosevelt Avenue goes through, and that's a big Filipino community. So that in and that in the sense is a down is a downtown is a mini downtown somewhere else in the city, but you know where everything works, everything feeds off of each, off each other because they can't all. Not everybody works along Roosevelt Avenue. A lot of folks work in Midtown. Or they work in the financial district, or they work, you know, in somewhere else in the city, and those things feed off of each other and create spaces, more diverse spaces, and then it's also a way to like discover new things, like you know, restaurants, sh entrepreneurs emerging in those other neighborhoods, and then finding a way to to come downtown after they've been successful. I mean, ideally, that's how it works. It doesn't always work that way in New York City, but you know, that's 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 the goal, and so. Um, the, yeah, there's a, there's that symbiotic relationship, uh, you know, between between the downtowns that that helps to that can help. Again, this is all like so tedious and, and it's tough. And you know, in New York City, the real estate industry drives so much of policy and planning, and um, it's tough to get other voices in there when when the real estate industry itself is 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 so uh, homogenous in in the voices that dominate that industry. So at our peripheral kind of, of downtown, we are seeing, we, we're seeing, I think, wonderful examples of collaboration, innovation, um, n look, no look no further than the North Loop, the Warehouse District, mm -hmm. where w these now buildings, these historic buildings are being repurposed. And so, Gabrielle, we, we've talked a little bit about, um, but there's some conditions that are happening that are actually creating that. Um, creating that kind of upward trajectory, that business growth, wanting residents wanting to move in. You want to talk about, I think you've had some experience with mm -hmm. um, understanding what's happening there that can actually be modeled across other parts of our, our, of our city and in, in, in downtown as well. Yeah, I think anyone who drives down Washington in North Loop um, 
you there is not a day that you don't see people moving and shifting and doing things and there's a reason for that there is something around um, the folks that are thinking and working and experiencing that space both residential thinking about food thinking about entertainment and they're talking to each other and marketing ways collectively as a neighborhood and as a space in which they want people to experience I don't know that that's happening in other places downtown. I don't know that the property owners and the folks that are in residential and entertainment and food are saying, hmm, let's figure out how we can market ourselves to consider getting um, people to, to come to this particular space. And so I think that, again, I don't think this is new. I do think that it is something that North Loop is figuring out how to do, and we're seeing the, the positive impacts of that. We're seeing people want to come down, and I do think that speaking to specific generations of where and how they're marketing that information, um, and that also speaks value to what um, he was mentioning in terms of the digital world. Like, where are we picking up flyers at the grocery store? Like, is that how we're getting our information? No, it's Instagram. It's, you know, things that are, are, are immediate and are accessible from our devices. And so I think the relationship between tech and digital, um, collaboration with people, and then thinking about how they want, what kind of culture and narrative do they want to create to get people to want to be in that space. If I can build on that, I totally agree. I mean, I think the the, the game now is uh, how does the physical environment do what the digital environment can't, right? And so you have to create immersive experiences uh, that you can't get any other way. And so it's really up the game of downtowns. It's up the game of the physical environment. Um, and there are many reasons why we get together in space to do the very things we're doing here, right? So it's not as if we won't need physical spaces, but they're going to change in function. They're going to have a competitor now, and everyone is going to ask, do I come in person or do I Zoom? And uh, that is a choice that everyone will continue to have. And so we have to make it a, a rich experience an unusual experience. And one of the other paradoxes of this pandemic is um, it actually, this kind of hybridization you were mentioning, Gabriel, is that, for example, with restaurants, one of the new trends is to actually go back and reimagine where restaurants began. Uh, they go back, actually, to the French Revolution, where you didn't go to a restaurant to just eat a meal the way we did. You went because it was a curated experience. And it's why the French king closed them down just before the French Revolution. And now we're sort of rediscovering that restaurants were these places where you actually in, were intentionally involved in entertainment or in a debate or in a conversation. And so uh, part of this is the opportunity, the business opportunity, is to, is to reimagine these activities in these new kind of hybrid creative ways. And I, I don't worry about whether we will be able to fi figure out what are those experiences, restaurants, museums, right. other thing, other right. things we can do with, with storefronts and other spaces in downtown areas. I don't worry about that because artists are brilliant. Mm -hmm. I'll just stop there. And <laughs> we've been art and they've been doing it for thousands of years as but far as they have as to be invited. Tell. They have yeah. to w yeah. that, that's the thing. Which artists and what kind of real estate model, planning model, right. development model, fi financial model is going to feed into and feed off of that? Right. Mm -hmm. Because right. the, the, the profit-hungry, endlessly spiraling upward real estate pr val valuation model it has, more, it has access to deeper pockets than, than, any, than everybody else. And it will capitalize on what artists do, as it always has. So, so you have to. The question is, can we can we figure out some other way to like manage and 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 and, and control and own real estate that doesn't s so heavily rely on endlessly pushing up the pri the, 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 the 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 value of property? Yeah, yeah. So two two questions. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, two things emerged out of this because Tom, I think you're pointing out that this is really the this is the design challenge, right? right? The, right. If we if we think about the principles of design, we go to what do people value, right? Right, and we start to design around that. And what we will value, and I think the thing that um, the pandemic 
told us or made aware is that we need each other. Mm -hmm. We desire connectivity. We desire to be in community and relationship with each other. And so as we think about the uh, reimagining of that, that's actually the thing that you're building. You're building spaces that continue to foster that, that you can't get in a digital world because you could have the meeting and frankly, we'd all prefer that the meeting is digital. <laughs> uh, but, but it's the other reasons why we come. It's the, it's, and so there's a lot of things about transitional spaces and the invisible spaces and spaces that actually when you leave your office, what actually gets you to stay Right, and not get on the bus, not exit, not leave, but actually fosters that connectivity. And so, yeah. Yeah, we did some research during during the pandemic about what would it take to get people to go back downtown. And one of the things we heard repeatedly was uh, that the office needs to be more home like, less office like. There needs to be child care. There needs to be, you know, a greater range of a place maybe for your pets. I mean, just a whole range of, of things that we have sort of excluded or zoned out of our central business district. We need to allow them back in. Yeah. yeah. And um, what are we, ta we're talking about equity. Like we're talking about yes. equitable models yeah. that support people having like a holistic full life. Yeah. Like perhaps someone could have a life that's not contingent on them working eight hours. Like, why are we working eight hours? <laughs> um, commuting, having to commute long distance. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And so, and I also want to say, like, speaking from the black experience and having been in deep, deep, rich cultural spaces, this has been happening forever. Like, forever and ever and ever. Like, amazing food with, with beautiful poetry and, like, these exquisite experiences that have been cultivated by, by brilliant people, not just artists, but, like, everyday folks. Like, the old elder who, like, can get everybody on the porch to, like, hear a great something. Like, those kind of rich cultural experiences that you cannot experience, you know, I can't experience by myself in my house. Um, and so we're seeing people do this everywhere. And I, in Minneapolis, we're just a little bit behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I, I don't know if you're behind. I. You might be. We, we, we all might be in a similar <laughs> similar place. But um, what, what was I going to say? What, oh, I was going to say. You know, it's not just about what bring can be bring people back to. Yeah. They're still coming. Yeah. When I was at Hen House, I talked to the manager. I asked the manager, "Hey, how is the business po pre and post pandemic?" And he yeah. said, "Actually, our busiest weekends ever." have been in the past two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Weekends. Now, weekday is a different story, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. But people still come downtown. So if there's not a baseball game to go to after you go to the hen house, what, what else could you possibly be doing? Because people are coming. That's what he said. People come on the weekends. And uh, I've learned today, I learned also this week that uh, for Twin Cities folks love breakfast for some reason, a yeah. lot more than other places. <laughs> yeah, I was at Hell's, like I said, I was at Hell's Kitchen yesterday. And, and we should, yeah, we shouldn't like get down because I mean cities struggle after pandemics, yeah. but they always come back. Yeah. And imagine they always come back. They could come mm -hmm. back differently, but yeah. they're back. imagine if that's you start. Let's start there. Like folks who come into downtown for breakfast, what if they didn't have to go to an office later or go back home to work? Mm -hmm. What if there was like I don't know a library or some other third space where they could go and yeah. take some meetings. Do do some emails, read some briefings, set, write some memos, whatever you, whatever the heck you do. In well, this office. is this idea of uh, third spaces being more important. I mean, there's this emergence of this new building type called neighborhood clubhouses. And what they are, they're emerging as places where you can have a meeting, where your kids could, um, you know, have childcare, where there's access to technology, which is one of the things people struggle with being at home, yeah. and um, and they're starting to pop up in neighborhoods all over cities. I just did a story about a co-working space in Baltimore, took over for a, a developer who couldn't figure out how to how to run the co-working space. The six, but this co-working space, this model, they succeeded. Black woman owned black mother owned, catering mostly to black mothers. One of the key assets they have is just a babysitting area, not a full child care area, just a professional, like a gym. Some gyms apparently have, I don't have kids, so I don't know. Yeah. Some gyms apparently you can yeah. come, you drop your does. kids off for yeah. like two hours, you do your workout, you right. do your yoga class, and you pick up your kids and you go home. So some of these, so this co-working yeah. space just has a babysitting area. You, 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 you have to book in advance. Yeah. You can drop off your, your, your kid for two, for two or three hours, do some YouTube videos or, or Instagram live 
live videos for for your business that you're building that you need to cultivate the social media audience for. Send some emails. Do whatever you need to do to work on your business for three hours. And oh, oh, guess what? When you get home, your kid's tired from being in the babysitting. <laughs> so now you've got two more hours at least of that kid taking a nap. It's it's wild. And th this co-working space, yeah, yeah. this yeah. is is thriving now. Yeah, yeah. And they're actually going to open up a second one in yeah, Atlanta. I'm sure. So you are just um, some some brilliant ideas that are coming forward here, and it it brings me to the question of, as we talk about this reimagining. Um, who needs to be in the room? Because right now, I, I think we're, we're still somewhat siloed. We're siloed with the business community all being in a room and talking about how we're going to get workers. We have city officials in a room. Um, but who needs to be in that room in this, in this new future? Well, a diverse population, obviously. But you know, one of the groups that I think is always overlooked are young people. Because we're building the city for them. I mean, they're, they're the ones that are going to inherit this. And I'm always struck by the people. Even if it's a diverse group of people, usually everyone's over 50. Yeah. And that's a problem, I think. Yeah, because yeah, now I'm like, Tom, who's young? You know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 what are we talking about here? Um, but, but I would agree. I agree. And, I, and actually, in the Downtown Innovation Group, we were just talking about this last Friday. Like, where are the young people? And how do we think about them having access to that space? And then more specifically, making sure that the diversity of young people, and as someone that thinks really um, extensively about youth development, a part of, like they just expanded development to youth development to the age 35, go figure. That like, you still have time to develop, you know, in your young adulthood. And that speaks volumes to something as someone who just crossed 35. Um, that that's important. It's important to consider that. So uh, definitely young people, um, but thinking about the diversification of that space. Um, and then more specifically, I am thinking about uh, knowledge gaps that show up, like that we have these conversations with different groups of people who are not actually informed about the facts that support the thing that we're all trying to do. So what is the policy? What is the intersection of urban planning? How do architects get things designed and passed with the city and the state? Like that, that space of diversification of facts and information and knowledge I think is something that is also incredibly important. And, and uh, yes, please, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and those rooms, I, I, I really hope, you, you, if they don't exist yet, maybe they exist, th these diverse spaces, places where, where there are voices thinking about imagining the future of, of Minneapolis. They might be out there. I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's, some, there's, there's commercial community land trusts in this city, mm -hmm. which aren't everywhere. And you've got them. Where, where, who's, where are those? Are those voices also being brought into? Like, hey, partnership and partnership and properties, commercial land trust. You've got uh, six. You got about six properties. Well, four and two more on the way, and they're they're in North Minneapolis and they're in Whittier. Are they? Is anyone talking about? I mean, maybe they can't get. They can't take a giant office building, but like, mm -hmm. and at least have them in the room and. You better make those rooms if they don't exist yet. If you better find them, or you better make them, because I, I prom because because so, there are rooms that already exist. Yeah. Wall Street private equity firms and their preferred lenders, they're already they have their rooms, yeah. and they're already they're already envisioning what to do, because a lot of them already have debt that they're s trying to service and can mm -hmm. keep 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 uh, keep alive. Those rooms already exist. So who, and where else? Are these conversations happening? And do they have resources mm -hmm. to implement yeah. some other vision mm -hmm. other than what these, 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 these big money developers want to do? So, so much of our narrative here in the city is when we talk and frame it about young people or when, we talk, when we're not talking about the business worker, it's oftentimes a negative light, especially when, they're in our, when we talk about them in our central business district or our core downtown. And I'm hearing this wonderful that they're so impar important part of the narrative and we need to write them into the story, invite them to the table to be a part of the creation of what this new, this new downtown is um, rather than seeing them as a nuisance. And I think that that's an important takeaway um, as part of this, this, this new storyline. As we, as we get close to here, and I, I certainly wanna um, open it up to the audience for, for a few questions. Um, Tom, you, you're writing about, uh, and you've written about, I'm sorry, the kind of post-pandemic 
I'm wondering though, as we build this this next thing, mm -hmm. how do we bake in resiliency? How do we think about future proofing a city so that it can withstand, because it's inevitable that we're going to see something on our doorsteps again, right? And so how do we think about that? Well, we need much more flexibility in our regulations. We need to not overly regulate. So many of our regulations have based on the 20th century city. We're out of that century. We're in a completely different world. We need to um, be very flexible in terms of uh, what people can do with the spaces they have. Um, I, I think as well, we need to uh, encourage you know much more diverse voices, obviously coming in as we've been talking about. Um, but I think that uh, you, you know part of this is just to be patient that cities are these long-term propositions, and that the the two previous pandemics led to changes that really took decades to happen. And we need to start the conversation. We need to create the processes that are equitable and that are the spaces where voices can be heard. But we also have to just give ourselves time that we have to recognize that this is, a, this is going to be, the, for the rest of the century, working its way out. And we just have to not get in our own way in terms of expecting it to be the way it was. That's the worst thing we can do is to say, well, we didn't do it that way before. Well, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our downtown has the, uh, it has the infrastructure for all these things to thrive, actually, right. right? It can create the density. It can create the mixed use. It has the intersections of all the transportation. So it has the right ingredients, right. Right. would you all say, for, for actually this new, this new reality to emerge. Um, and... One of the, the and I'll, I'll ask you all to say what what are the action steps and what are, what are the what's your call to action to city leaders to urban planners to the business community as we think about this. Um, so maybe perhaps that be that will be my final question here. Oh, call to action. So whoever you are in the ecosystem, if you're an urban planner, if you're a banker, if you're a real estate developer. Uh, Talk to somebody you else in the ecosystem who you never talked to before, and if you can't find anybody, you that, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> like let me let, let me. Uh, I'll just tell you, like uh, I was I had back. I was at Hell's Kitchen with with Land Bank Twin Cities, and they're telling me like they've got BIPOC developers calling them, wanting to work with them on more properties, and Land Bank Twin Cities doesn't have the resources to work with them on every deal. There, there there's too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's already a crop of uh, emerging BIPOC developers, in part from the investments after George Floyd. There were, there were I know, there, I understand there were some investments in that developer space. Uh, so, I mean, but, but, but why are they? Why is the land bank one of the few places? They, who else can they call? Can they call the community foundation and say, "Hey, can you buy this this building and hold on to it for three years while we get while while we get our financing and our business plan together to to refinance this out into a into a a, work, uh, a, a revenue generating business plan? Like, just give us some time, because that's what the land that's what the land bank twin cities is doing. You know, partnership and properties commercial land trust got their pro their properties through the land bank, but I, I I I'm telling you on Tuesday they said we can't do every deal that that we get called about. So there are developers. In this city, BIPOC developers, emerging developers, new developers who are ready to do more and to do bigger things. Who else can they call? Because the people they're calling are already tapped out. Um, I think the biggest thing, and I'm just going to stick to stick to the main my main thing, which is how do we not think about things mutually exclusively anymore? How do we not think about, you know, residential and entertainment and restaurants as these separate things? And a part of that, I think, is for the urban planner and the architects and the council members to consider that every time you try to expand or insert something that's cre creative, and that's never been done before, it's a risk. It's a risk and, and it's an important risk because we are not preparing for ourselves. We're preparing um, for the next generation. And also, like, I hope I benefit from some cool stuff too. Um, and people thinking in fresh and vibrant ways. And that's not going to happen if we're trying to hold our coins um, or the traditional experiences um, in these very, you know, 
you know, rigid ways. It's just not helpful. So blow up your concepts and ideas and consider who needs to be in the room to support that expansion. Yeah. Well, I also think we need to do more to pay attention to local business and lo local entrepreneurship. I mean, one of the challenges with this pandemic, as with previous ones, is that the deep pockets companies survive. The chain, this, you know, with the chainification of American cities is going on. And, uh, and so I think we need a, a very concerted strategy to help local businesses reemerge. And I think we need flexibility in how that happens. Um, I think we also, back to zoning, I think we need to rediscover where zoning was back in 1926 when the Euclid case happened, which is it basically said, uh, what you do downtown is really up to you. We're, not, we're gonna uh, exclude noxious industry, but otherwise, if you wanna live in the back of your store, go ahead. I mean, um, and so what we've done is we've regulated out all of this opportunity and flexibility in people's lives, and we've got to find that again. We've got to allow that to happen. Yeah. Well, um, a really rich, and I could continue to go on because I, I didn't even get into uh, what's the role of our the corporations that are down there now and how might they create inviting spaces in their buildings and yeah. lobbies that are vacant that could be activated yep. um, with artists and and our great Nicolet Mall, and what are our opportunities with yeah. that? And so conversations to be had in the lobby. But um, questions, um, are there someone facilitating? Yes. Uh, raise your hand if you have one. We have Mary here in the front. We have one over there, perhaps. Someone's coming down the staircase mm -hmm. to pass the mic to you. Oh, oh you passed her. Oh, okay. <laughs> We can hear you, so go. That's okay, I'm really loud. Yes. So. <laughs> um, hi, Tom. Hi, yeah. Mary Margaret. Yeah, sorry, I'm with the American Institute of Architects, so thanks for all the shout outs to architects. So appreciate <laughs> it, yes. Um, I have no doubt that we have a wealth of creativity and ideas that could transform the city in amazing ways. Where I get stuck is on the lack of access to capital and the major infusions of one-time money that have happened since the murder of Mr. George Floyd, since the pandemic, will not make the systems change necessary for there to be access to patient capital on the regular. And when we talk about land trust, you know, that's great for stabilization, but it doesn't create ownership and generational wealth building. So there are different ownership models that I think we need to be looking at. And one of the thoughts I had coming over here when they were talking about, was this a bailout of the, the banks over the last few days? Is there a bailout that needs to happen for the big office towers to just say, it's okay, here's your cash, go on. And now the city is gonna take over this building and we're gonna turn it into what it needs to be, working with architects. The other thing is, thank you. The other thing is that um, when you talk about symbiosis, the fact that Minneapolis has been a net contributor to the economy of the state for a very, very long time. It's time for the rest of the state to recognize how important this economic en engine is as it is revitalized and made something new. It's time to give back to Minneapolis. <laughs> You know, let, Mary let, Margaret, uh, Tom Horner interviewed me about what I would recommend to do with the state surplus. And I, I said, we need to s set up a fund that's this patient capital for, for these kinds of things to happen, right? And uh, we, have, we have this idea in this country that somehow the government doesn't want to pick winners. Y Europe, the rest of the world doesn't think that. I mean, that's the role of government is to actually help people, right? And uh, so let's use some of this surplus money to create the fund that pre creates the patient capital that we need to make this transition. I yeah, in a... Uh, let, let me just give you some, uh, some uh, what do you call it, um, solidarity. You may, you may think New York, in New York State that the city and state are... No. They, right? No, no. <laughs> New York, Al Albany, for, has, for, for decades, yeah. has, has hated New York. Yeah. Um, I'll just stop there. So just, just some solidarity and sympathy on, the, on that front. I mean, the rest of New York elected George Santos. So uh, we, we clearly yeah, know there's no... Yeah, <laughs> 
we, we clearly have, know that there we is have, no we have this we have this issue too in New York, <laughs> even in New York City. So yeah. you know, don't worry. But yeah. okay, uh, here on the front row, I believe there was a question. Yeah, right here. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from the perspective of somebody who lived 18 years in New York and then <coughs> moved to Uptown because that was vibrant then and uh, I have an office in North Minneapolis. My mother lives downtown Minneapolis. Um, One of the things that I am interested in learning how can this happen is I forgot until I was in New York again last year, I'd been away for a few years, I'd been proud when I came back to Minnesota and s- recognized that there was more diversity here than I remembered when I was growing up. But when I went back to New York, I was struck by how segregated we are in Minneapolis. And and part of that is, you know, there's the luxury buildings here, there's the affordable housing buildings over here, and how do we do a hybridization of that? Um, and then, and, and what is that? Is that policy? How does that happen? Yeah. Um, and then with that also, I know during the pandemic, it was Denord and McGizzy and some of those others. They have a real collaborative neighborhood feel, um, Longfellow as well. And so how does downtown do that? piece of it. I, I, and I would also say Uptown is in trouble, so I don't know what's happening yeah. there, but yeah. I think a developer's buying everything. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we certainly haven't been great students of Jane Jacobs when we, thi- when we think about the diversity, diversity of business, diversity of income, diver- all of the things in which she advocated for, um, and certainly Manhattan has the diversity, but it's for a particular class, um, parts of it, uh, and so there's a lot of intentionality that could could happen in this reimagining to make sure everyone is included. Mary, did you have a question? <laughs> or a statement. Um, or a thought about yeah. this idea about like who needs to be in the room. And I, I think clearly like people with resources, the bankers need to be in the room. Um, and thinking about how, and, and thinking about these new models and ecosystems and where we are um, on this side of the pandemic. and. I think one of the things that got accelerated was an understanding of um, family units mm-hmm. shifting. And so when we think about residential downtown, and you know, you were saying people want offices to like homes or a place, you know, childcare is so important. But we also know that a lot more families are living multi-generationally mm-hmm. with adult children, with seniors, <laughs> all in the same household. And I think I know from my experience with developers in New York, that drive to create you know, that housing tends to be for young adults. That's how people think about who lives downtown. <laughs> and so there's, if you do have a family and you have two kids or you have an aging parent living, you know, aging in place with you, like there's nowhere to live. <laughs> I mean, and that's right. true everywhere. But, but I guess so I think about how do we like to center humans <laughs> in this process and like do, and I don't know exactly who this is. Is this anthropologist? Like who helps understand how people live together and how we can create spaces for evolving ways that we're living together? You know, Mary, we did a, we looked at what it'll take to redo an office uh, building into housing. And one of the things we found is it lends itself to this form of housing. We don't have much here, but it's very common in Europe called co-housing which is multi-generational shared housing, and it actually lends itself to office buildings. I'm sorry, Gabriel, you were gonna say something. Exactly. Go ahead. Say the thing, Tom. I, um, the, the only thing that I was gonna say is I think it's important to bring the people who are living that in the room, um, who has you know families and parents that you're taking care of or, or whomever. Um, I think having that experiential knowledge is critical to thinking about how to build a new or build that in ways it's already happening in other parts of the world. So I think there's the experiential, there's the resources, but there's also just like practicality of considering that that is something that happens in families um, and in communities that you you can't, you often don't get to plan for, it just happens and then you're responsible and then what? Um, Where do you get to live in this, you know, I wouldn't, I would call it more of an expanded community or an expanded family space. The, um, one of the from the AIA, one of the things I think to watch is the initiative of the groundbreak strategies being led by the McKnight Foundation, because I think that there's going to be a model there. Now it's not particularly intended for downtown, but certainly innovative capital and how banks and philanthropy, of, of course, RTs at the table for that as well, 
um, can come together and are weaving different capital stacks and structures together actually to support entrepreneurs. The other thing, that I, and we'll perhaps close it, but we've also, we have a, we have a, the tax structure in a city that says actually downtowns have to work because most of the revenue that supports the essential services across the city is generated from the tax base in downtown. One block, the IDS Center, if you will, right, the amount of tax revenue that it produces is more than some neighborhoods. And so there is, uh, there is the way in which our city functions says that this has to come down until we can completely reimagine how we might fund other city services. That's right. Yeah, uh, you know, just, just before the pandemic, we were asked to write a new piece of the, the Minneapolis zoning code around intentional communities. And this is also a movement in other parts of the world that we don't have here as much, which is that we, instead of doing speculative development, which ends up typically going to the high end of the market, is that you actually develop around people who want to live together. Uh, be it a multi-generational family or people who just want to be in community. And so there are these things happening elsewhere that this is an enormous opportunity for us to embrace, is things that are working elsewhere in the world that we haven't done, and we now have lots of empty space and a lot of opportunity to do it. And, and this is also... The the answer to if I if 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 you if you force me to answer your question, Mary, the qu the answer <laughs> is, and I I've, t I've been talking a lot of crap on them, but the answer is developers, right? There, you know, the developers you have to f figure out okay for housing, how many of those families might be out there do I, that I think I can serve, right. what do I think they can pay either in rents or in a mortgage, and how much do I need do I need to to assemble to get them that product whether it's rental or, or, or for sale housing. And um, community land trust, you know, there's a, there, there's a, there was, there used to be a thing in this country called the starter home. And community land trusts have, this one in particular, City of Lakes has data to show, it can generate starter homes for families. It doesn't create like an immense amount of wealth, but enough to like get you from that one, two bedroom to that three bedroom right. or, the, or to that four bedroom. Or uh, and 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 uh, and this is also the reason why I want you know if you're a banker or if you're a developer like develop you need to have those discussions with somebody else and someone you haven't met before because those those developers and and the, and the bankers you know they work on narrative you know you have to think to yourself there are these many families I think I can serve I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna serve them and now I, and now we're gonna, I'm gonna go to a bank and I'm gonna need to give that bank a business plan does that, and does that bank believe does that does that bank believe that there is that market out there mm -hmm. and where else and 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 part of the answer is gonna come from somebody else right that developer going to that bank that if that bank hasn't heard someone else tell them that they that there is a market out there for different kinds of housing setups, then that, that banker is just going to shut down that developer. It's not even going to give them a second, give them a follow-up call. Well, we could clearly keep going here as we were starting a whole other conversation. But please help me, uh, um, join me in um, thanking these esteemed guests, Tom, Gabrielle, and Oscar, for coming this evening and sharing their knowledge. I believe Megan, or Ma Amanda, is going to come to the stage now. Light me up. I'm so energized. Thank you to our panelists, Adair, for moderating. Thanks to all of you for being here tonight, Nina, for our ASL interpretation this evening. Front and back of house, thanks for making tonight possible. Let's all continue the conversation in Bazinet Lobby where we have drinks and food, uh, a QR code to scan at the end of this, but also on stanchions upstairs. Um, and, and let's just keep talking. Thank you again so much for tonight and join us for the next one on April 12th.